are back with another Solomon's Gold series with a continuation of the first century mapping mindset. More detail from Pomponius Mila coming up next. And this becomes even more obvious now just reading his words. Then the Periplus of the Eurythrian Sea. And, you know, how could we say they are pinpointing the Philippines? It's obvious. Those who can't read that map are stuck in the wrong mindset. So they can't read it. Uh, they have no understanding, no foundation, no basis to read it. We don't care how many letters they have behind their names. In fact, it only makes their stupidity far worse when they do. So we'll map and show you again in the proper mindset. And what about Dionysius, uh, Perigetes, Perigetes, the tourist? Uh, how do we read his map from his words, 124 AD? Well, pretty easy in the right mindset of the first century cartographers slash historians. Let's get to it. Again, this is where confusion can set in, but you have to understand why and how and where it comes from. And really, Mila tells you. Here it is. Taprobane is reported by Hipparchus uh, to be either, so there's a choice, it's one of two places. Oh, gee, what are these two places? Well, you'll see. Uh, it's either, to be either, some very great island. Well, what's that? That's Sri Lanka. The great island. It's a very large island. Uh, but see the confusion. Or, or, he's saying here. Uh, so it's, or another island. Not Sri Lanka. Got that? So it could be Sri Lanka or it could be something else. What's that? See, that is the mindset of the first century cartographers, largely. And they viewed this as the same island, at least in the same place. They confuse it back and forth. Why? Because the orange area is missing. And when it's missing, Sri Lanka and Sumatra, the other option, are the same place. No, they're not really, but they are in the mindset of the first century cartographers and historians. Or else, the Greek ones. And they're the ones that ran the route. So they're the experts, not any other scholar. Or else the hittermost part of the other world. Now, that would be Sumatra, historically. And again, even Pigafetta still says Magellan viewed the historic Taprobane in the actual location of Sumatra, not Sri Lanka. Now, is Pigafetta wrong for saying that? No, because what Magellan is doing is following directions after Sumatra because he knew this first century mindset. He knew about this orange area on the map, which wasn't there. Thus, Sri Lanka, Sumatra are the same thing in that context. But you would call it or you would place it in Sumatra. Because again, the other parts just don't exist. So that would be a landmark worthy of following. And that's why Pigafetta uses it. It doesn't mean some authors don't mean one or the other. Of course, they do. Some maps do. Some call Sri Lanka as Taprobane. Some call Sumatra as Taprobane. That is fact. And you can see that throughout history. It was back and forth. And then someone will argue, no, 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 no. No, Taprobane's definitely Sri Lanka. Someone else will argue back, no, Taprobane's definitely Sumatra. It's both. That's the point. <laughs> it's confusion in that time because the area from one to the other doesn't exist on maps. <laughs> there you go. So, uh, again, are they the same? No, of course not. That's not what we're saying. But this is exactly uh, why we showed you this. It makes sense. And here you have an historic reference that backs this up. For Sri Lanka in the first century mapping mindset, it's right next to the Philippines, which you could also call Sumatra, right next to the Philippines, because it's physically there. And the accurate one for Pigafetta to use in his time uh, as far as trying to figure things out uh, in position. Either way, but he gives us even more detail here of this land of gold and silver. 
But for as much as it is inhabited, and no man by report is near about it, it shoots near the truth. Now, in other words, yes, some people do live there despite reports otherwise, is what he's basically saying. So he's not saying nobody lives there. Someone tried that. And okay, now learn how to read the whole sentence because he says the opposite. On the contrary part, there are the mouths. Mouths, rivers have mouths, right? He likely means, of course, the rivers, but he's missing, again, that entire orange area we showed you. So again, next to the mouth of the Ganges is the Philippines in the mindset of Mila and the first century cartographers, despite how wrong it may be. Or, get this, he means the mouths or gates of the sun, which are found where, historically? <laughs> well, first of all, let's see what he says here, because uh, he nails this down. He says, called the gates of the sun. Oops. Uh, the sun historically does not rise in India. Uh, there's no history to support that, and Indians don't say that either. It's in the Far East that it's considered to rise. Why is that? What is that mindset about? Well, it comes from First Enoch, because he defines that uh, as the Far East, where the gates of the sun are, uh, where the sun rising, the sun rises, okay? Uh, and the Greeks definitely are of that mindset. We'll show you in a couple of videos, indisputably, many references that agree. Now, Mila was a Greek, and he agrees too. So, the land of the Garden of Eden is where the sun also rises, and that's the Philippines. So we've proven that, well proven that. Watch uh, Answers in First Enoch, especially, uh, I think it's part 12 where we do all the maps. It's incredible, uh, but it, you just can't, I mean, Enoch maps it, and you just can't misunderstand its directions. Northeast of the east exit of the Indian Ocean, uh, where Malaysia is, are uh, the Isles of the Garden of Eden. That's called the Philippines. That has always been the Philippines, and there's nothing else there. So there's nothing to discuss. These are not by accident. This is where the sun is considered to rise through gates. And by the way, in the next video, that is not just what Enoch says, but it is exactly what the Greeks say uh, in very ancient history. Maybe it's two videos, but we, we'll get there very soon. Um, this again supports uh, what we're saying, and this is how you read this map. That's it. You really can't read it any other way. So uninhabitable, he says, that as soon as men enter into them, into what? Well, the gates where the sun rises. Now, that's hot, folks. That would be really hot. Now, that's a legend, okay? But it's also in Greek mythology, and you're going to see why Mila says this. Because this is an overwhelming Greek mindset, and it originates in First Enoch. The outrageous heat of the calm air smothers them by and by. The Philippines is known as the land of the morning, the land where the sun rises. It is known as a very, very hot tropical land. And it is, trust me, I know, I live there very hot. But you wouldn't want to be in, well, the gate where the sun rises, would you? No, that's for certain. And that's not reality in terms of down here on the surface. Uh, all of Enoch's uh, explanation is in the firmament way up there in the sky. So the sun's way up there in his mindset. It's not down here. The Greeks put it down here, and that's wrong, but they also insert false gods and other things. Yes, this mixes Enoch into Greek mythology, and we'll explain more again in a couple of videos. We're going to nail that down for you. This also affirms these are the isles in the far east as mapped in the Philippines. And there's more. Now Mila will hit us with detail and all of these truly match the Philippines. It doesn't mean some of them can't match someplace else. That's not the point. We're testing the Philippines here. So that's what we're looking for. We're not testing the whole world because Mila doesn't map Christ in the whole world, does he? No. He's defining this in a way it really cannot be misunderstood. Between the mouths, what's he talking about? lie a scattered country 
somewhere void of inhabitants by reason of the intolerable heat, which is really just repeating himself with both of those points there, the mouths and the intolerable heat. Again, though, many places on Earth are incredibly hot. There's no doubt about that, the equator, the tropics. Uh, this is a continuation of the reference to the land where the sun rises, and that is the land of the Garden of Eden, that is the Philippines. From thence to the entrance of the Red Sea. He's not talking about Egypt here, and he'll tell you so. Uh, that's the Indian Ocean in this mindset, and he'll explain. Uh, India is not at the entrance, though, of the Indian Ocean, is it? No, but that's in the orange area that's missing. See? Gotta understand the first century mindset. He's in the Far East in these directions very clearly, uh, in the land that houses the gates of the sun, where it rises, which was never in India, period. And But again, in the first century mapping mindset, they have India and China next to each other on the coast. And the Philippines is parallel with India. And the Ganges empties into the South China Sea. Again, that's all wrong as far as India. See, again, India is what is wrong, yet India is what most scholars will try to use to identify those islands. That's called stupid lies a way less and desert ground. No, not a normal desert. Get this. Uh, and if you look at the soil of the Philippines, that would be an accurate way to look at it, really, uh, in, in many areas, especially the coastline uh, in many places. Uh, yes, it is fertile soil, but it also has dusty, you know, a, a lot of soil that, that doesn't, uh, isn't, you know, grass. Uh Lies a way less than desert ground, we said, more like ashes than dust. Oh, wait, you mean maybe someone whom uh, he was reading is talking about a volcanic eruption where they saw ashes uh, as the soil? Well, that perhaps could be. Uh, that would fit, no doubt. Uh, he's referring to uh, the parts of the Philippines that have coral embedded in the soil, especially. Uh, near the coast, and uh, so it's a rocky uh, soil. And the soil type of the Philippines, uh, in especially the coastline areas, actually fits this description uh, in many areas very well. No, it's not the only place on Earth with that, but again, we're testing the geography that Mila saw, and we're already in the Philippines here, and this fits. That matters. And therefore, there run out of it very few streams, and those not great. Now, it's funny because the Philippines doesn't really have significant rivers, really. And even though they're called the people of the river, Tagalog, it's people of the river, Tagalog, um, understand that they're not talking about, in ancient times, that word really originates from the Pisan River, which surrounds the Philippines on the bottom of the ocean floor. Watch our Rivers from Eden series where we prove that out. Uh, that matches, really. Uh, he uses words that really tell us much here. Let's read. Whereof, here say, the notablest... Now, he just defined rivers, so it sounds like he's talking about the notablest of rivers... Uh, that's what it seems to be uh, attributing here with these names. Uh, he already said these are small, and they are, there's no doubt. The Philippines doesn't have major, major rivers, nothing really large. Uh, some are fairly long, but not, not, not like the Nile, uh, not like the Amazon, not like the Ganges. You know, th there's nothing like that there. Uh, are, and get these names, Tubero and Arus. Arusakas. Now, it just so happens that this word to barrow may well be a Tagalog word in origin, referring to basic tubular plumbing pipes, very appropriate for a river. Uh, fascinating. Uh, that could actually be a Tagalog word, and there also is a small river in Tubao, Philippines, maybe. Uh, it could fit as well. Uh, though a river that is tubular of sort, I mean, it's pretty vague, but it fits, nevertheless, and as Tagalog, the language of the Philippines. Wow. Then, uh, what's this word? Uh, or maybe two words? Uh, 
Arusakas. Hmm. Well, we're not sure. Uh, we can also find in the Visayan dialect uh, the word arus, uh, A-R-U-S, as sufficient, enough, fit, proper. Okay, that's a good word. Uh, with a second word, uh, Tagalog, sakai. Perhaps a mixture, perhaps. Uh, we can't prove that, but it sounds like it could be a match. Uh, as we test this out in other ways. Sakai means to ride, basically. So a sufficient ride in Philippine languages may be. It certainly sounds like a good name for a river to me. Not sure on that, though Tubero well could be. Back to the Red Sea, though. Mila writes this. The Greeks, now whether uh, because it is uh, of that color, he says... Uh, that's not actually a physical description. Uh, the Red Sea is not red. Uh, he's guessing, and that is meaningless. Okay, so understand that. Uh, and you see this in scholarship in those time in that time period. And when they go that route, there's nothing wrong with it. So they're speculating a little. They don't know. They're just trying to figure out. Maybe it's because of this. Maybe it's because of that. That's fine. He doesn't know the actual answer, and that's okay. Even uh, the Red Sea, though, it's not actually red. Uh, it, it, uh, this isn't that Red Sea uh, in Egypt at all. We're in the Far East. But it's connected to it far away and okay to use in ancient times because he's not the only one that does. Uh, but he defines that. Or because one Eurythrys reigned there. Now, far more likely, and he means what also is noted as the Eurythraean Sea, which is the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea. All the same, that's what he means here. Again, understand the mindset. The Indian Ocean. The entrance of the Indian Ocean at that part of the world, Mila is discussing here in basically Malaysia, Indonesia, and again, India is not there, uh, but that's not on his map. The Philippines is next to that. There you go. So, call the Red Sea Eurythrin Thalassan, or Eurythraean Sea. Uh, it's the Indian Ocean geographically, without question, in all of history. And here we go. Awesome data, which really defines this. We are in Southeast Asia here, beyond the Indian Ocean entrance, or really exit, by the way, that comes from First Enoch yet again. Uh, this is the part of it known for great storms or typhoons. What? It is a stormy, rough. Okay, wait. We all know Malaysia doesn't really get typhoons. Extremely rare there uh, because it's too far below the, the line where typhoons form. But the Philippines... Is the typhoon capital practically of the world, really. I mean, these days, uh, super typhoons are, well, it's just another Tuesday, right? Uh, they're happening all the time, it seems. Uh, then it says, and deep water. Whoa! Hmm. Did you know the Philippine Deep is the third deepest place on all of Earth? Ha! How about that? And uh, it's also in the area of the second, which is Tonga, the Tonga Trench. And the first is the Marianas Trench, both close to there. Uh, there really is no question here what he's talking about. And nourishes huge beasts more than any or all other seas. Wait a minute, you mean it has more marine life than anywhere else on Earth? You mean the center of the center of marine biodiversity? Yeah, that's called the Philippines. Factual. According to 120 marine biologists who released their, uh, their data in a scientific journal, such as the Carpenter Report and others, and that has been widely reported even by CNN and others, uh, even though CNN took it down after we covered it. Thank you, CNN, for being frauds. But wow, did you know the Philippines also has legends of huge, I mean massive beasts in the sea. There's Bukanawa, the giant sea dragon, who is so tall he blocks the moon. Wow. Likely, that's Leviathan of Scripture. And again, the legend may or may not be exactly as he is, but very ancient. 
and one rooted in fact initially. That is the largest beast on earth, by the way, according to Job. You don't get one larger. So, wow. Uh, really fits. And no, he was created by Yahuwah, by the way. He was never an evil spirit. There's no such thing as an evil spirit, Leviathan. Uh, he is literally a sea creature and the one of legends indeed. I know we hear he's just a legend only. No, there is fact that is behind that. Are some of the stories made up of the attacks at sea and other things? Perhaps, and perhaps not. There are many eyewitnesses, uh, you know, those accounts over the millennia, no doubt. But that doesn't matter. The point is the Philippines embodied this legend. There you go. Um, boom. Uh, so there really is no disputing Pomponius Mila as mapped, most certainly places Christ, the Greek land of gold, in the Philippines at Luzon Island, uh, which also matches other mappings of this time. You'll see, we'll cover. Then Argyre, they like to argue, but in the first century mindset, when you understand it, is still the Philippines in the south, fitting to Mindanao, northeast of Sumatra and the Sunda Islands. Really not that hard. Around 70 AD, the Greeks sailed to India, and this Greek sailor records the details. They asked the Indians and Sri Lankans where the ancient land of gold was, as Christ, for the Greeks, is Ophir of Solomon, and it is the Indian and Sri Lankan uh, Suvarnadweepa, indisputably. We've covered that before. Uh, so they gave him directions at that point, and he records this. These are the directions from the Indians and Sri Lankans. Get that. That the Isle of Christ, the Greek land of gold, or Ophir in Hebrew, Sivarnadweepa in the Indian languages, uh, in the last part of the inhabited world toward the east. Okay, so we're in the far east. That's pretty easy, isn't it? Under the rising sun itself. There we go again. This already nails this, but he does go further and really nail this down in a way that you just can't mess it up. But see, most scholars uh, just ignore it. They just ignore this part. Uh, what is this land in the Far East where the sun rises? It's the Philippines. Always has been, and we've proven it. You just saw it in Mila's description of these hot lands where the gates of the sun are which is a match to Enoch's mapping to the Philippines, northeast of the Indian Ocean exit. Never really a question when one knows their ancient history, which you won't without Enoch and Jubilees especially. Now, you can rule a bunch out right away here. Uh, is India describing uh, to the writer of the Periplus its own land? Now, that would be truly stupid. Yet, that's the British position. They can't read and they commit propaganda to say so. Is India in the Far East? Well, no. It's in the Orient, but not really the Far East. It's where the Orient begins. It's not Far East. The islands are the Far East. The coastland are the Far East. So, you still have a ways to go. And the Indians say so. Is India far east of India? Hmm, should I even have to ask that? We all know the answer. Now, Africa, out. Saudi, Yemen, fail. Mesopotamia, laughable. And even India, Arr! wrong answer. Thanks for playing. These all fail horribly. And so will the Malay Peninsula in a moment, though we've already talked about that, but never recorded as the area where the sun rises period. This doesn't fit it. Again, this is our mapping of the written directions in the Periplus of the Erythrean Sea, Erythrean Sea, however you say it, uh, the Indian Ocean. Uh, this sailor never passed the Ganges River. Okay, understand that. He never went there, but he records where it is because he got the directions from the Indians and the Sri Lankans, which cannot be Ophir, Christ. Tarshish, Argyre, period. They say so. So, get to know your history there, British. Uh, however, that's only half the description, and already cannot be any place else but then 
the Periplus uh, as well gets very specific as we continue to see. Now it starts a new paragraph. <gasps> what? Oh, you got to throw that out then, right? I understand some scholars are very challenged to figure out uh, that this is still the same thought. Because uh, when they write, well, of course, they never use paragraphs, evidently. I mean, a new paragraph means the whole topic changed. It's a different book, right? That's stupid. That's not scholarly. That's not academic. Don't be so dumb. Grow up. They already know how stupid that is, yet some actually ignore this part, such as the authors, uh, Thomas Suarez being a major one we've covered, uh, especially in the book, and he commits gross negligence. The guy should have been fired for this. Uh, he certainly was intending to mislead, as many British do. Why? Because, again, the British pay good money for propagandists. Uh, you know, they, whether they do it directly or give them good titles and positions uh, of dunderheads and master dunderhead and, uh, you know, better, you know, greater dunderhead and head dunderhead, you know, th those are just wonderful. That's what they want. And pay comes with it, too. OK, that's nice. But stupid, stupid. That's all it is to it. Um, basically, they hide the actual land of gold, which they never found. The British didn't and aren't known for that. Uh, and they never will in their mindset, which is a thousand years before the progressing view, which is stupidity. This is what the Periplus says in 70 AD. Who cares what the British say in 1625 and beyond? What a ridiculous, non-historic paradigm to ignore the ancient and grab the modern misleading, uh, you know, propaganda. Nonsense. So sad. After this region, under the very north. Okay, so it just said after this region, referring to the previous paragraph. Therefore, this is a continuation of the previous paragraph. Is that that hard? How can academics not read? Amazing. Under the very north. Ding, ding, ding. Uh, there we go. Now, we know exactly what the very north is. It begins at the Tropic of Cancer. That's how it's defined. A line is drawn around the world, and everything north of that line is considered the very north. Got that? So it begins there, all around the Earth. But in this area of the world, it runs through South China and Taiwan. And it's under that in the South China Sea. Pretty easy. Okay. Where are we here, uh, he tells you? The sea outside. Outside? Outside of what? Well, is there a sea inside of China? Duh. No. Uh, the sea outside of mainland Asia, the China Sea, East China Sea, South China Sea, but it's the China Sea essentially today. Um, how, how do we know this, though? Let's read. Ending in a land called this. Now, this is capitalized. This is a name. It's actually the name for China, uh, specifically and nowhere else. It's well recorded throughout history. We've covered that as well. We passed India to where? The South China Sea, to the east of mainland Asia at China, and south of China and Taiwan under the Tropic of Cancer. What could that possibly be? Is it a mystery? This is ridiculous. How unacademic for someone to say, well, I don't know where that is. Well, play stupid. All you want, we won't. It is only the Philippines and nothing else, period. There's nothing to debate. There's nothing to discuss. Now, once again, the first century mapping mindset kicks in. And this is where most scholars seem to forget that. And then they go back and they change the words from before into their worldview, trying to hide Ophir. But it's, again, very illiterate. And just opposite this river, now he's talking about the Ganges in India here. So opposite the Ganges, what? There is an island in the ocean. Well, there's not. So we have a problem because there's nothing significant there. There's no big land of silver there. It's just not there. So what are they talking about? Again, not in the Eurythraean Sea. 
They're in the South China Sea because they think the Ganges empties there. So look at the area with the orange again. It's not there in this mindset. He can't see it because he didn't go there and doesn't know it completely, but well enough to maintain the data accurately in the final conclusion if you know and understand the first century mapping mindset. Essentially, blur that out, the orange area, and this makes perfect sense, especially when it says this next. After these, the course turns toward the east again. He just described the turn into the Indian Ocean at the Malay Peninsula, uh, basically, uh, or the other way around, actually heading north now. Uh, when you turn the corner, uh, though on a flat earth map, you know, you, you just keep heading east. Uh, and, and that's how he viewed it, because that is the mindset. Yes, flat earth is the mindset of the ancient Greeks. That's called fact. And you see it here, right here, right now. Uh, yes, there is a cult within who did not see it that way. Uh, as same within Babylon, uh, there was a cult that believed that there were nine planets and they revolved around the sun. And that's where that comes from, not actual science. Now, most ancient maps uh, basically are flat earth maps. That's just fact. And whether anyone likes that or not really doesn't matter. Uh, that was their mindset and they're the ones that mapped it, not you. So who cares whether you like it or not? Uh, that is east after India and the Indian Ocean, really. It doesn't turn at India, but when heading east, it turns after it at the Malay uh, tip, basically. That's where you pass that, and then you turn, right? Uh, but this will affirm this. And sailing with the ocean to the right, that's Pacific Ocean, South China Sea, got that, uh, and the shore re remaining beyond to the left, the Ganges comes into view. Now, again, what he just did was place the Ganges in the first century mindset, where Indochina is, and the Malay Peninsula, of course, in Indochina, are not actually even on the map, because, of course, that's in India. And that's why you see India there next to China at the coast, which we know is not the case. It's missing geography. He describes heading past the Malay Peninsula, turning north, east on a flat earth map. That is the only explanation of the, Indi of the ocean, on the right and the Ganges on the east because he sees the Ganges as just before China, which we all know is wrong. But that is the first century mindset, very easily reconciled. And there you have it. Now he writes, and near it, the last land toward the east. Where is that? That's the islands. That's the Philippines. He already told you this was an island in the ocean, by the way, not a peninsula. Now, we have to follow what he says and understand the mindset of the era. And now we do. Now, advance to 124 AD, about the same time frame, Dionysius the Tourist, uh, Peri Perigetes, uh, maps the Isle of Christ. Now, he's repeating pretty much everything we just saw in Aristosthenes, Mila, and the Periplus of the Erythraean Sea. Uh, these all agree, and these are all credible and accurate. On screen, again, when you understand the mindset of that era, was the mindset completely accurate? No, but when you reconcile it, it all makes sense, and it comes into full plain view. On screen is a map, a reconstruction. Uh, again, uh, what we actually have are written directions, of course. And this map is accurately portrayed uh, because Dr. Conrad Miller understood the first century mapping mindset. Many do not. So yeah, you can go and look up another map and say, oh, it doesn't show that. Yeah, well, so what? That doesn't matter because, you know, when when the writer describes where Christ is and you find a map that doesn't have Christ there, well, the map is stupid. I mean, it doesn't really matter who did it or how or what. It's missing part of the directions. But we're going to read them, so don't worry. Uh, or at least part of them. Uh, just kind of breeze through these, uh, the highlights. Um, so, 
There's Kreis, an island southeast of China in the South China Sea. You can see very clearly. Uh, we know that as Luzon Island, Philippines today. Uh, the dumbest blogger in all of history actually claim, well, that's the Malay Peninsula. Now, that's stupid. Uh, once again, we have what appears mixed up geography, and it is only scrambled when you do not apply the first century mapping mindset. Again, India is mislabeled on this map. The Ganges is mislabeled on many of these maps as emptying into the South China Sea. Uh, neither do and neither are there, and you're missing geography. It's very clear. What's glaring is India is in the wrong place. Uh, the Malay Peninsula, Indochina, Burma are missing. Again, no surprise when you know the mindset. We should expect to see this and already know how to rectify it. Now, here's what Dionysius writes. Uh, we're just going to pull this out. Um, and uh, his words from his own primary writing, of course, English translation. Uh, we source this uh, in our book and our source book. Uh, from the North Sea, if you read the full directions heading east to the Pacific, these directions say, from thence, if a man sailing towards Scythia, understand Scythia in ancient times, even identified on this map, and also according to the British Encyclopedia and many, 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 many others, uh, is all the way east into Mongolia to the coast, uh, as the Sakai, okay? The Sakai are the Scythians, one in the same. In fact, you'll see some maps that show the Sakai in the Russian steppes. Yes, that's Scythia, but Scythia sprawls through uh, all the way. It skirts Russia. The Russian steppes go all the way over to Mongolia. They're not just uh, over there north of Armenia. That's not what, uh, that's not a, a, an accurate representation. So they live there. You turn his ship to the east. Okay, so you're in Scythia and you head east. All right, and really you're in the area of the Sakai. You're in Mongolia and you're heading east. But either way, you're heading east and you're going to go into a sea. What's that? That's the China Sea. We know that. That's pretty easy. Uh, he's taking this trip from the North Sea um, in these directions. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, did he take the trip himself? We have no indication that he did. He's getting these accounts from others, but he's putting them together accurately. So now, so because it agrees with the other maps, in fact, so heading east from the North Sea, he passed the Sakai or the Scythians of Mongolia. That's where we are. He shall find Chrysia. Now this Christ, the Greek Isle of Gold, uh, Ophir in Hebrew, which is Another island of the ocean. Get that ocean, okay? Uh, again, it's an island in the ocean. That's not a peninsula, and it's not on the mainland. So both fail, and the Malay Peninsula is laughable. I mean, it's just hilarious to think that academics go there, uh, that they try to insert a peninsula when these ancient cartographers knew better, and they say it's an island, 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 it's an island in the ocean, it's an island, it's an island, it's an island. It's southeast of China, it's below the Tropic of Cancer. I mean, well, how hard is this? It shouldn't be. And the fact that it is shows you that it's just propaganda. They're trying to hold this back, hold this knowledge back so you and I don't know it. In the which also the sun shineth very clearly. We saw that in the Aristosthenes. We saw that in Mila. We saw that in the Periplus. We see this consistently. This is an area where the sun is very bright. Why? Because this is where the gates of the sun are. This is where the sun rises, uh, even according to Mila, and waxes incredibly hot. Well, we know where that is, folks. The prophet Enoch defines that. He maps it out as northeast of the Indian Ocean, northeast of Malaysia, and that area today is called the Philippines. Watch answers in First Enoch or read the book, firstenoch.org. Uh, download it free in ebook, and you'll see the mapping there. You can follow it yourself. You will never be able to disprove it or say it says something else because it doesn't. Then, if he return him contrary to the south. Okay, so he headed east into the sea, then he goes south. Okay, so it's pretty easy. So he's in the North Sea, goes east into the East China Sea, or, uh, you know, in the northern part of it there, uh, and now he's heading south. How far south? 
Oh, he'll tell us. Don't worry. I mean, this is so specific. You really can't mess it up. He's exact. Immediately, he shall discover Taprobana. Oops, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is that Sri Lanka? No, not in any sense. But remember the mapping mindset of the first century? Taprobana and Sumatra are in the same place because everything in between doesn't exist on the maps. See, not real hard. Are they truly? No, of course not. They're not really that close, but the mindset is the mindset. So again, this sounds confusing, but it makes perfect sense. Uh, yeah, you don't end up in Sri Lanka in the South China Sea. Duh. I mean, I, I think. Can anyone think, right? Okay, so in the first century maps mindset, this is so clear. He's talking about the Philippines, but he's going to be very clear now. As you read, he firmly defines it this way. They lie directly under the line of cancer. Now, that's an old English, of course. The line is the tropic of cancer, uh, a very, very distinctive geographic marker. Indeed, for those who think that somehow Malaysia, which is on the equator, yeah, not even close, somehow is moved all the way up to the Tropic of Cancer, uh, and that a peninsula became an island somehow, that's illiterate. That's just nonsense. Blinded by the paradigm of propaganda from the British. Uh, and they don't represent the truth, let's be honest. Uh, don't call yourself an historian, scholar, nor uh, scientist on this topic when you can't even read a map. Don't know the definition of a peninsula and don't know where the Tropic of Cancer is. Duh. Uh, and can interpret very distinct directions like this. I mean, how hard is this? It's really not that hard, is it? Now, I know we had the most illiterate blogger in all of history try to claim that Dionysius, well, he's not really a scholar, so he his map doesn't really count. Well, first of all, they wouldn't matter because there's other maps. We didn't just show this one, but that is a lie. I mean, talk about stupid. Uh, he doesn't even represent history accurately remotely. Well, let's see what is said about this Dionysius Paragetes or Paragetes, uh, the tourist, known as the tourist. Uh, well, let's see. This is from Princeton University, of course. Uh, that blogger would then uh, attack Princeton, of course, is, is not scholarly enough. Stupid. Uh, later, uh, perhaps in the second century AD, a versified world tour or Paragesis, uh, attributed to Dionysius, subsequently named Paragetes, Paragetes, the tourist that is, that one, the same one we're talking about. He's referring to that specifically, the one we just covered. And look, was this academic attributed to Dionysius here? Well, uh, yes, it was, according to Princeton. If you see Princeton as... Uh, prestigious university, of course. Uh, if you don't, you don't know anything. Uh, enshrined the Greek view of the whole earth for late antique and in Avenius's Latin translation. Okay, so there's published again. Uh huh. That's republished even because, well, Dionysius is historical fact. Duh. Medieval readers and students, they taught it as historic fact. How about that? Yes, this guy was a scholar. Here's another one. From the British Library, formed, by the way, as part of the British Museum, though now separate, uh, on the works of John Tsetsis. This paper manuscript was completed in 1493 in southern Italy. What was it teaching? Hmm, let's see. It attests to John Tsetsis, uh, importance to the Greek scholars of the Renaissance, and what work does he cover and republish as credible and academic fact? Hmm. The manuscript also contains the verse description of the world by Dionysius Paragetes. Ha! Huh. Yes, that's the tourist, the one who we covered, and it is a credible academic mapping, treated and republished as academic. 
See, this is the, <laughs> you know, basically the way uh, we have forgotten in opposition to this position. This is it. Uh, you know, all they know is how to forget things or how to uh, ridicule, steeped in ignorance. I mean, to ridicule this guy and not realize he was a scholar when he's called a scholar, he's republished as a scholar, is just stupid. Uh, no one has to agree with what Dionysius wrote, of course. Not on its own, and we don't either on its own. No, we confirm it in other works of that era, and they all agree. And they happen to agree with the Bible, and they happen to agree with Greek mythology that goes all the way back to 800 B.C. We're about to cover, but we've already covered back to 600 B.C. Proven fact. Now, that's called credible proof. And that blogger, nor any academic, rabbi, pastor, theologian, has nor ever will disprove the conclusions of this series. They try to pick at it, but see, they can't. Because even if Dionysius could be marginalized, so, and he can't, they still have the problem of the others they can't ignore. And together, these are far too strong to disprove. In fact, they prove Dionysius is credible on this topic uh, because the geography is the same. So then they just ignore our case and try to comment, not even knowing what we prove or don't <laughs> prove. And that is addressed well with the historical quote attributed by many to Einstein. We don't know who actually said it. We don't care. We care whether the the quote is truth or not, and that's why we'll use it. Condemnation without investigation is the epitome of ignorance. Indeed. If an academic wants to come at us, you better do much more than ridicule, because we prove your paradigm stupid on this topic many times over, even in this video. When you learn how to read a map, and how to read, period, then try to come at us. Go ahead. But if you haven't reviewed our position, you will be muted every time. Our channel, our rules. No debate in ignorance. We're not wasting our time with such. Otherwise, every single enemy, especially the racist blogger who hates everything Filipino uh, and should be in jail, though likely still will, uh, looks like a fool here, especially his 60-plus illiterate blogs, uh, all proven stupid. Uh, the others who try to hijack our research uh, to lead to China and Russia look like a circus clown already. Uh, most academics who have reviewed our full position, well, they, they don't even try to debate it. And many who came in with that intention to disprove it have admitted they cannot debate or argue with these findings. Whether the paradigm who lost Ophir and the Garden of Eden ever admits their ignorance really doesn't matter. I mean, come on. Many of them are far, far uh, too afraid to do so for lots of reasons. They could lose their position, in fact. We have proven that is their position, and we have obliterated it at this point many times, many ways, and this portion really does. Take heart, uh, but don't look for the control system to support these findings. We don't. We don't expect it, uh, and we don't care because we don't need the ones who lost the land of gold to now figure out they've been wrong all this time and admit it. That's not likely. We prove our position. Done. Here's another mapping, a reconstruction, which is all we have in that era, really, uh, in map form. Uh, or the this is the 124 AD directions uh, from Dionysius. They're rather hard to mess up, really. He's in the North Sea, enters the Eastern Sea Ocean, uh, which is called the China Sea, and heads south. How far south? This isn't guesswork. To just beneath, below the line or tropic of Cancer, which goes through South China in that part of the world and through Taiwan. And just south of it is what? The Philippines, obviously, and nothing else. There's no other option. Uh, if one is an academic and they just said the Malay Peninsula is there, well, they should be fired. They don't know their geography at all, not even a little. 
What is this large island just south of Taiwan? It's Luzon Island, Philippines, period. Southeast of China again, just below the Tropic of Cancer. Duh. This isn't hard at all. But those claiming you don't read this that way, well, they just can't read at all. You can't read it any other way. Dionysius the scholar made sure of that. He was extremely specific. It'd be like telling you, you know, here's directions to my house. Uh, I live right next door to City Hall, right? And then um, you come back at me and you pass City Hall uh, you know, and I, and I tell you, it's, it's just after City Hall, right? Or it's just before City Hall. But City Hall is the marker, okay? You should be able to find City Hall. Okay, now, so you find City Hall and you know that I told you it's just before it or just at whatever. And, okay, so you know where it is, right? I mean, is that hard? Is it really that difficult? I mean, you've been given a marker that is even more entrenched in history than that to find these islands. And somehow they go to Malaysia, or they go to India, or they try to inject uh, Saudi Arabia, Africa, uh, Spain, and Britain. Those are so stupid. Just a simple reading says, no way. Once again, the same mindset of the first century must be understood here. The orange block, again, did not exist on most maps then. In their view, there was no Malay Peninsula. Some have a bump for it, but that's it. But that's not the Malay Peninsula. Come on. I mean, it, that is a dynamic geographical feature. Uh, one could not mistake as a bump. Um, nor Indochina, uh, again, because they just didn't exist on these maps or weren't represented really in full. Uh, to then come in and use India as the marker when it's what's wrong with this map in position uh, requires a mindset of willing ignorance on the part of scholars who just don't get it. Now, Dionysius mentions, Then, if he return him contrary to the south, immediately he shall discover Taprobana. Again, this is easy. Uh, that is Sri Lanka in some, to some in history. It is Sumatra to others, as Pigafetta, who is latter uh, and likely accurate, uh, as he speaks from Magellan, the explorer who actually knew the area and charted it <coughs> with accuracy even, uh, in his words, correcting the likes of Ptolemy, in fact, which we'll show you. Now, how? Again, can Sri Lanka be confused for Sumatra because in their mindset, this orange area simply doesn't exist. Sure, it does actually exist. Yes, we know that now. But that is the original uh, mindset and the confusion because the two are placed in the same place in the first century mapping mindset. It's a progression of knowledge where they are reconnecting the ancient route of the Greeks and really Solomon because they see Sri Lanka and Sumatra, right? They know of these two islands, not by name, and they're calling both of them Taprobana. Some refer to it as Sri Lanka, some as Sumatra, but it's the same place in their mindset, in their mapping, really. I mean, reality. Uh, the mindset says the Philippines, Luzon Island is right next to it. If you cut out this orange area, and it is. There it is. Pretty simple. Easy to see. Uh, this proves they were accurate in their geography. Uh, for the mindset of the era, which was steeped in some things, not accurate, but hey, that's life. That's, that's how knowledge progresses, and you learn. Is it a surprise this Israelite, Phoenician, and Greek route was then lost to the Romans? Well, it shouldn't be. See, again, Tarshish was Greek, and that's his family. I mean, that's just reality. Uh, and this was his route originally, uh, Greek absorbed the Phoenicians, Solomon's navy, and retained this route, uh, which again, they would be entitled as family of Tarshish, but they couldn't leave anymore from the port of the Red Sea, which was broken up. We've covered that in an earlier video, uh, in just before the time of Jonah, and the uh, ship of Tarshish actually circumnavigated Africa and was there in Joppa, Israel, according to Jonah, historically placed. 
Greece is not the ships of Tarshish, uh, no, but they come from the Philippines, uh, Tarshish itself. His place of migration, or the ships of Solomon, uh, were then built to replicate this journey from the Red Sea, at least, and those were called the ships of Tarshish. However, once those were broken up, when you see ships of Tarshish, it's referring to ships coming from the Philippines, from the land of Tarshish itself. And yes, we've covered the ships of the historic Philippines, and yes, there is documentation they had such even way back then. Now, in the next video, we'll bring this home with ladder geography. Uh, we'll discuss Columbus and Magellan and the era of Ptolemy, uh, who many academics try to use as the Bible for ancient geography. And you know what? That's fine from many other parts of the world. But for Southeast Asia, that's laughable and illiterate. Uh, he doesn't find something that he doesn't even know exists on his mapping. Duh. We have over 470 videos on this channel, one for every day of the year plus now. Uh, many just as profound with some 50 or so in Tagalog for Filipinos and now six in Spanish to start. We also have been setting up subtitles for 20 plus languages for most of our videos. Don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell for notifications of new uploads. Join our email list as YouTube fails to notify often. And we will notify you ourselves at thegodculture.com. Just fill in the pop-up there. We now have alternative platforms for videos on Rumble, Odyssey, and Utreon. And our new podcast is available for all of our videos pretty much as well. All links in the description box. And friend us on Facebook at The God Culture, space hyphen space original. That is our only Facebook page, only one that we're checking and using. Uh, if you prefer an alternative... We now have Parlor and Gab, links below. We have six books published internationally, being read in over 100 countries. Uh, and actually, I correct that, it's now seven. How about that? Uh, with our new release, the first book of Bible History Illustrated, Enoch's Animal Dream Visions. We also have now launched Ophir Philippines Coffee Table Book in the U.S., Canada, U.K., and many overseas markets on Amazon, and it's available in hardcover or softcover there. Also, this uh, first book of Bible History Illustrated is available only in color. We're not even doing this in black and white. Only in color, and you can get it in color, uh, softcover, or hardcover on Amazon. Uh, coming to the Philippines soon, not yet, we're not there yet, but we will get there. Additionally, we launched the Book of Jubilees, the Torah calendar, with color maps and interiors, as so many had requested that overseas, uh, rightfully so. Uh, we already have that in the Philippines. Uh, the Philippine copies have color maps inside already. Uh, that too is available on Amazon in hardcover, softcover, both in color or in black and white soft cover, if you wish. Uh, all books, including Solomon's Treasurer, are now free in ebook. Uh, we're not going to do an ebook for this one because we have this video series animated, and we're going to release one with all five uh, as one video as well. So, no need to do an ebook when we'll have the video animation. Uh, more coming soon. Thank you for watching. Now always remember, prove all things for yourself. Yah bless to everyone.